Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the European School of Urology webinar. My name is Viru Kathy Visvanathan, and I'm a urologist from UCL in London. Today, we're going to talk about MRI and its role in the diagnostic pathway for prostate cancer. And I'm going to focus on some of the evidence behind um, what underpins the pathways that we adopt in practice today. So the talk will last for about 30 minutes. And throughout this, you can pose questions through the question portal. And at the end of the webinar, I will have 15 minutes to go through these questions. These are my conflicts of interest. So let's start by talking about the role of MRI in prostate cancer diagnosis. So many of you will be familiar with the data showing the incidence of urological cancers in Europe. And you can see the first point is that as urologists, we have a lot of work. Secondly, that the most incident cancer is prostate cancer. And like in the UK, where prostate cancer has overtaken breast cancer as the most commonly diagnosed cancer, we anticipate that in the next 10 years, we may see the same trend in Europe. So this is an important problem. Let's think about what the ideal test for prostate cancer would be like. It should be minimally invasive, identify the patients who stand to benefit from treatment, avoid the diagnosis of patients who may not benefit from treatment, and have a low complication rate. And I think these are important considerations when thinking about the role of MRI and other tests in prostate cancer diagnosis. So this is the traditional pathway where men with a raised PSA or abnormal digital rectal exam have a truss biopsy. Now, we know from studies which use PSA and digital rectal examination as the entry criteria for diagnosing men that this doesn't lead to a pathway where men will necessarily benefit significantly from treatment and it can lead to significant overtreatment. And certainly, there are ways in which we can optimize the pathway. And this explains why in the current EAU guidelines, MRI is recommended after men have been referred with a raised PSA, an abnormal digital rectal exam. To start off with, we're going to focus on the evidence underpinning this. It's important to note that the evidence is stronger for men who have a prior negative biopsy than it is for men who have no prior biopsy. So evidence, of course, is emerging with time. So let's start off with the PROMISE study. So the PROMISE study was a multi-center UK study in 11 sites. It looked at 576 men with clinical suspicion of prostate cancer who had a PSA of less than 15 with an abnormal DRE as well. So these men underwent a 1.5 Tesla MRI scan. And the key aspect to this study was that both the clinicians and patients were blinded to the MRI. All patients underwent a general anesthetic, and they had two biopsies in one sitting. The first biopsy was a very detailed five millimeter transperineal template prostate biopsy. This was followed by a 10 to 12 core truss biopsy. After that, the MRI results were unblinded and were compared to the transperineal template biopsy, and the truss biopsy results were compared to the transperineal template biopsy. The primary outcome was the diagnostic performance, and the primary outcome was a significant cancer detection with Gleason grade 4 plus 3 or greater, or maximum cancer core length, counting as significant. They also explored several other definitions for clinically significant cancer. This diagram is quite an important one. It shows that the MRI Likert score of suspicion remains one of the strongest predictors of significant cancer that we have in prostate cancer today. You can see the Likert score on the x-axis, and as the Likert score increases, the association with significant cancer also increases. And at this point, it's important to reflect on the scoring systems used in prostate cancer diagnosis. And if centers want to achieve results like those seen in some of the clinical trials, it's important to standardize both the conduct of MRI and the reporting. And some of the scoring systems like the PIRADS 
version 2.1 scoring system, which is the current latest system commonly used by people, is a good way of knowing how to conduct your MRI scan and also how to report them. So let's focus on some of the misses by MRI and truss biopsy in the PROMISE study. Of course, it's important to appreciate the limitations of MRI. So interestingly, from the PROMISE study, MRI missed no Gleason 4 plus 3s, which are the really bad um, perpetrators. It did miss 3% of men with Gleason 3 plus 4. Truss biopsy, on the other hand, missed 19% of men with Gleason 3 plus 4 or greater. If we look at the primary outcome, we can see that the sensitivity of truss biopsy was worse than that of MRI by some way. MRI also had a greater negative predictive value than truss biopsy, but it did have a lower positive predictive value. And this is because of false positives. This is where the MRI says that there's a suspicious area, and when biopsied, it doesn't turn out to be cancer. This confirms that we still need a biopsy after a suspicious MRI. So MRI does miss a notable proportion of Gleason 3 plus 4s, but the important thing to note is that the majority of these misses were low volume or were Gleason 3 plus 3s with a maximum cancer core length of 6 millimeters or greater. So from the PROMISE study, we concluded that MRI was superior to truss biopsy in the detection of clinically significant cancer, and MRI could perhaps be used as a triage test prior to biopsy in biopsy-naive men. Now, one of the limitations of the PROMISE study was that there was no targeted biopsy, and in clinical practice, we can't perform these detailed 5 millimeter template biopsies in everyone. And in clinical practice, we use the MRI information to influence how we do the biopsy. So the assumption that MRI-targeted biopsy would be as good as transperineal template biopsy still needed to be tested. And that's where the precision study came in. So the precision study was another multi-center study in 25 centers in 11 countries. The group you can see here were the START consortium who produced guidelines on how to report studies of MRI-targeted biopsy. And the study was conceived within this meeting. The precision study looked at men with a clinical suspicion of prostate cancer with a PSA of less than or equal to 20 and or an abnormal digital rectal exam. They were randomized in a one-to-one -one fashion to a 10 to 12 core truss biopsy or a multi-parametric MRI with T2 weighted, diffusion weighted or contrast enhanced sequences. The MRI was scored according to the PIRADS version two guidelines. If the PIRADS score was one or two, the patient had no biopsy. If the score was three, four, or five, they had a targeted biopsy with up to four cores per suspicious area and up to three areas targeted. Now, this was the first study in which men with a negative MRI had no biopsy, and men with a positive MRI had a targeted biopsy only. The primary outcome was slightly different to that of PROMISE. It was men with clinically significant prostate cancer defined by Gleason grade three plus four or greater. We also looked at the proportion of members clinically insignificant cancer and some of the post-intervention complications. We can see from the baseline demographics of the patients that the randomization was achieved successfully. 28% of men in the MRI arm avoided a biopsy altogether. There were a median of four cores taken in the MRI arm compared to that of 12 in the truss biopsy arm. And for the primary outcome of clinically significant cancer detection, this was greater with the MRI arm than the truss biopsy arm. And however you analyzed it, it confirmed that not only was MRI and targeted biopsy non inferior, it was actually superior to truss biopsy in the detection of clinically significant cancer. Looking at the secondary outcomes for clinically insignificant cancer detection, MRI detected fewer men with this disease, which is a good thing. Cancer core length was slightly higher with the MRI and targeted biopsy arm. And the proportion of men, the proportion of cores positive for cancer was greater with the MRI arm. 
with regards to the 30-day patient reported complications, we can see that for fevers, hematuria, hematospermia, blood in the stool, erectile dysfunction, and pain, these were all in favor of the MRI arm. So the MRI-targeted biopsy strategy resulted in fewer men needing biopsy with fewer calls, more men with clinically significant cancer and fewer with insignificant cancer detected, and a more favorable 30-day patient reported complication profile. Of course, let's look at the limitations of this study. So men with negative MRIs had no biopsy, and there's a question mark as to whether or not those men needed a biopsy and what we should do about them. Also, men who had a positive MRI did not have systematic biopsy, and there's a question mark over whether some men with significant cancer would be missed by that approach. Of course, the radiologists in the precision study had a median experience of 300 MRIs reported per year, which is reasonably experienced, which means that if someone were to adopt this technique in their own center, they would need to make sure that their radiologists were experienced to get the same results. So the question is, are the results seen in studies like precision also seen when you look at the literature as a whole? So this is a meta-analysis of all studies comparing MRI-targeted biopsy alone to systematic biopsy, where systematic biopsy could be a truss biopsy or a transperineal template biopsy. So it compares the cancer detection between the two. And the main outcome was that the targeted biopsy alone, just like seen in precision, detects more significant cancer than the systematic biopsy. In addition, it detects less insignificant cancer than the systematic biopsy. So these results are reflected in the rest of the literature. So we accepted that one of the limitations of the precision study was that men with a positive MRI did not have systematic biopsies, so we were not able to evaluate the role that they played. So let's move on to the MRI first study. So this is a multi-center French study in 16 sites. 251 men with clinical suspicion of prostate cancer underwent either a 1.5 or three tester MRI scan, which was scored on the LICET scale. If the MRI was suspicious, the man underwent a local anesthetic biopsy with two biopsies in the same sitting. The first biopsy was a 12 core truss biopsy plus any additional cause to hypoechoic lesions. The second biopsy was a targeted biopsy with up to three cores per suspicious area with up to two areas targeted. And interestingly, the operator was different for both biopsy procedures. If the patient had a non-suspicious MRI, they underwent 12 core biopsy alone. The primary outcome was the proportion of men with clinically significant prostate cancer which was the same as precision, please in grade three plus four or greater. They also looked at a number of other definitions, particularly high-grade cancer detection. For the primary outcome, MRI and targeted biopsy detected 32% of men with significant cancer, which was only slightly more than that detected by trust biopsy, and there was no significant difference between the two. However, when looking at higher grade cancer, these in grade four plus three or greater, we can see that the MRI and targeted biopsy arm detected statistically significantly more men with this disease. Let's now focus on the added value of the targeted biopsies and the systematic biopsies within this study. If we look at the primary definition of cancer detection, overall 37% of the cohort had significant cancer, 25% of the cohort had significant cancer detected by either technique. Unique to the MRI-targeted biopsy, 8% of men had cancer detected by this, and 5% had cancer detected uniquely by the truss biopsies. When we look at higher grade disease, we can see that 21% of the cohort had least in grade four plus three. Of these, 14% had significant cancer detected by both techniques. 6% uniquely by MRI targeted biopsy, and only 
uniquely by truss biopsy. So what do we learn from the MRI first study? Well, first of all, according to the primary definition of Gleason grade three plus four, four MRI targeted biopsy did not detect more than truss biopsy, but it did detect more higher grade disease. And their conclusion was, if you want to maximize Gleason three plus four cancer detection, then you should add systematic biopsy to this. It's worth reflecting on the difference between these two important studies to try and understand why there may be differences. In precision, up to three suspicious areas were targeted with up to four cores per suspicious area. In the MRI first study, there were two suspicious areas with up to three cores per suspicious area. And we know from studies published in the literature that the more cores you take, the more likely you are to mitigate some of the targeting errors. So this could play a role in the differences the population was slightly different, with the MRI first population having almost double the prevalence of men with suspicious digital rectal examinations. And one could hypothesize that a truss biopsy in a man with a suspicious DRE may be more effective than in a man without a suspicious DRE, and the effects of targeted biopsy may be less beneficial in the group of men with suspicious DREs compared to truss biopsy. In addition, the study designs were different. Precision was a randomized design. And when one was taking targeted biopsies, they knew that they could not do systematic biopsies. So each targeted biopsy counted that much more. In addition, MRI first was a within patient design where each man underwent both biopsy tests in the same sitting. We know that the performance of one test could have well influenced the performance of the other. The targeted biopsies were taken second it's very possible that consciously or subconsciously, the operator performing the targeted biopsies may have been influenced by things like needle track marks in the truss biopsy. So let's look at what the rest of the literature shows in the role of systematic biopsy from meta-analysis of this data. The important um, things to consider from this analysis is that significant cancer was defined by the study, not by a particular Gleason grade, so there's a varying definition per study. And the patient group is a mixed population of patients. In addition, the systematic biopsy, as mentioned previously, included the detailed transperineal template biopsy. So in this study, we showed that adding the systematic biopsy to the targeted biopsies detected significant cancer by 13%. So moving on to the negative MRI, some of the limitations of studies like precision were about what happens in those men with negative MRIs who don't have a biopsy. So this study by Panabianco et al. answers this question quite nicely. They looked at 1,545 men with a negative MRI, 659 were biopsy naive, and 596 had a prior negative biopsy. They were followed up with a PSA, digital rectal exam, an MRI every eight months, and a biopsy as per an MDT recommendation. Of note, at four years, 95% were cancer-free in the biopsy naive group and 96% in the prior negative biopsy group, which supports the practice of not biopsying some men with a negative MRI. So let's put all of the evidence we've discussed together in looking at how our pathway is currently underpinned. So men with a raised PSA or abnormal digital rectal exam have their multiparametric MRI. If it's negative and the man is at low risk, you could avoid a biopsy. Those men could go on to PSA plus or minus MRI surveillance. If the MRI is positive, the man can have a targeted biopsy and if needed, a systematic biopsy. The EAU differentiates between the need for a systematic biopsy by the background of the patient. If the patient ha has biopsy naive, they recommend combining targeted and systematic biopsies. And if the patient is, has a prior negative biopsy, they recommend performing targeted biopsy alone. The question is, if you have a negative MRI and the guidelines recommend avoiding biopsy in low risk, what does low risk actually mean? 
So this meta-analysis, which has just been published in the Journal of Urology, shows particular other biomarkers that can be used to determine low risk. And one of those which showed the strongest value was PSA density. This is a very easy um, example to measure. It just requires the PSA value and the prostate MRI measurement. And a PSA density of less than 0.15 was shown to increase the negative predictive value from 84% to 90% in biopsy-naive men. If you look at men who have a prior negative biopsy, the use of PSA density in combination with negative MRI increases the negative predictive value to 94% from 88%. So there are obvious tools which are available to all of us which we can use in our clinical practice. So one of the questions um, which is commonly addressed is which is better out of in bore MRI targeted biopsy where the whole biopsy is done in the MRI scanner with MRI compatible equipment, cognitive biopsy where the landmarks of the MRI are used to correspond to landmarks on the real-time ultrasound when performing the biopsy, and image fusion where the MRI scan is overlaid onto your real-time ultrasound scan in order to help you direct your biopsy course. So a study by Weigling et al, a systematic review, looked at the pooled sensitivity of clinically significant prostate cancer by the three different techniques. They showed that there was no significant difference for clinically significant cancer detection between the different techniques. They then also carried out a randomized controlled trial called a FUTURE study, which randomized 234 men with prior negative biopsy in a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one fashion to each of the techniques. Of note, there was no significant difference between the detection rates of the three techniques. And this was because an unexpectedly high number of patients had a negative MRI, so did not undergo biopsy, and the study was overall underpowered. Another important study to talk about is the SMART target study. So this study looked at 141 men with prior trust biopsy. Each man with an MRI lesion underwent MRI targeted biopsy by both fusion biopsy and cognitive registration. They were performed by two separate operators, and the order in which the biopsies were performed was randomized. The operator performing the biopsies was also randomized. And the operator for one biopsy technique was outside of the room when the first biopsy was performed. So the outcomes of this study showed that fusion biopsy and cognitive biopsy each detected the same proportion of men with significant cancer. <coughs> of note, each method uniquely detected 14% of cancers that the others missed. So the conclusion of the study was that each technique detected unique cancers, and when combined, gives the greatest cancer detection. <coughs> so what does this mean for you at your own center and what you should be doing? Does this mean you should be investing in inboard MRI and inboard MRI compatible equipment? Probably not. So because no technique has shown clear superiority, my personal feeling is that you can use a technique that you have expertise in. And if you have a center which has good expertise in cognitive biopsy, this can give you high detection rates. However, it is nice if you do have a fusion biopsy system. However, there is a sampling error with fusion biopsy systems. And as the SMART target biopsy study demonstrates, you should not rely only on where the fusion system tells you to biopsy, and you should do some cognitive biopsying with that. <coughs> so let's talk about biparametric versus multiparametric MRI, which is a topical issue in this field. So the multiparametric MRI consists of three sequences. The T2 weighted sequence, which looks at the anatomy of the prostate, the diffusion weighted sequences, which look at the diffusion of water molecules through the prostate, and the dynamic contrast enhanced sequences, which look at the vascularity of the prostate. If you take away the contrast enhanced sequence, 
that gives you a biparametric MRI. Now, some of the early studies have shown that taking away the dynamic contrast enhancement may not compromise cancer detection, but it has a number of advantages, including avoiding the need for uncomfortable cannulation and a need for a blood test for renal function. In addition, um, when you use contrast, there is a need to have a doctor in case of a contrast allergy, and you need staff to cannulate the patient, which can be avoided by biparametric MRI. You could also avoid the use of gadolinium contrast. We know that the gadolinium contrast accumulates in the basal ganglia, and the long-term effects of this are not known currently. In addition, it will give you a shorter scan. And when we have recommendations, which are now European, UK, and US, recommending MRI should more likely be considered upfront in all men with suspicious, suspicious or prostate cancer, it's important to be able to have an option to increase your capacity so that we can achieve every man who needs an MRI scan getting one. However, before we change practice from a multiparametric MRI to a biparametric MRI, it's important to acknowledge the limitations of the studies which look at this. First of all, many of them have a small sample size and many of them are retrospective. Some of them lack targeted prostate biopsies, which we know should be included in standard of care. And one of the most important limitations is that many of them lack clear blinding of the radiologist to the contrast sequence when they actually score the biparametric MRI. This might make the biparametric MRI look better. In addition, the standardized scoring system that most people use, which is the PIRAD scoring system, already assumes that contrast has a limited role in the detection of cancer and it doesn't make a difference between performing a biopsy or not. Therefore, um, comparing biparametric MRI with multiparametric MRI using the PIRAD scoring system would not allow you to show that contrast has a role. Therefore, um, there is a study currently being planned called the PRIME study, which is led by UCL and supported by the EAU Research Foundation which is looking to investigate the difference between biparametric and multiparametric MRI. Now, one thing to mention is what the future holds for MRI and prostate cancer diagnosis. And from the previous slides, we know that it's currently used after a man is referred with a raised PSA or abnormal digital rectal exam. So there's a new study which is currently recruiting called Reimagine, which is being run in the UK from UCL, Imperial and Kings. It's actually looking at um, using MRI earlier on in the pathway. It's using to, looking to see whether if we use our best test, whether we can better identify men with cancer that needs treatment. Now, any kind of screening study is very controversial. And this study is a feasibility study in which patients from GP practice are randomly invited to undergo an MRI scan, which is a short MRI scan, and they also have a PSA. And we're looking to see what the prevalence of MRI lesions is, whether patients would accept the invitation, and other outcomes such as patient experience. So studies like this may hopefully redefine the role of MRI in the prostate cancer pathway. So the 30 minutes is now coming to an end, so I'll leave you with some take-home messages before we go to some questions. So we know from several guidelines groups that multiparametric MRI is recommended prior to biopsy in men suspected with prostate cancer. We know that a non-suspicious MRI can be used to counsel patients um, to avoid biopsy if they have a low risk of cancer. And an example of what low risk means is those with a low PSA density. We know that a suspicious MRI can be used to direct additional biopsies to these lesions to increase cancer detection. And we know when thinking about what type of registration software to use, um, there isn't any particular advantage over cognitive versus fusion versus in bore. And those uh, with their expertise at their local centers should focus on that. And if they have a fusion system, that would be nice. So we have some time for questions. So I would like to hand over to the audience, those of you listening at home today who have tuned in to 
pose me some questions and I'll just get those up now. Okay, so um, we have a question. So do you go for biopsy if the MRI is negative and the PSA is below 10 with no suspicion on digital rectal exam? So I think um, most of these decisions are made with the patient. So you can have a discussion about the likelihood of detecting cancer. If you have data from your own center, that would be even better. So we know that men with a low PSA density, so that's less than 0.15 and a negative MRI, have a very low risk of having prostate cancer. So that would personally guide me to informing a discussion with the patient that it's, um, they could avoid biopsy and could safely undergo PSA surveillance. If, for example, the patient felt very strongly that they wanted to biopsy, then it's something that we could certainly consider doing. But my recommendation would be if they have a low PSA density and a negative MRI to avoid a biopsy. Okay, so we've got a question that says, if you do MRI targeted biopsy in one area and don't get significant cancer, how do you know that in the other areas there are no significant cancers? So this is an important point. So before any center moves towards MRI targeted biopsy only, it's important for them to evaluate how well the MRI performs in their own hands. And this will mean when you start, you perform MRI targeted biopsy and systematic biopsy together. And all of these results should be reviewed in a meeting where you have your radiologist, the urologist performing the biopsy, and if possible, a pathologist. That way you get to review where the uh, radiologist thought the MRI was suspicious and combine that with the pathology information and you can decide whether or not the biopsy is likely to have hit the target. You can decide whether there are any areas of the prostate that have been uh, missed that were suspicious that weren't targeted and if necessary recommend them for another biopsy. Once you have an idea of how good your performance of targeted biopsy is in your own center, then you can have the confidence to drop the systematic biopsy. Um, that's what I'd recommend in centers starting. Okay, so I've got a question here. Um, if you were to prioritize patients to having an MRI in the pre-biopsy setting, which characteristics would be most important? And a couple of things have been listed as possibilities, including PSA or PSA density. Now, PSA density requires the volume of the prostate to be estimated and uh, without having imaging uh, using a digital rectal exam, we know that we're not perfectly accurate at doing that. So PSA density wouldn't be an easy one to use in advance. And PSA is probably uh, one of the uh, easiest biomarkers to use upfront to decide who gets an MRI in the first place. Digital rectal exam, of course, is important as well. And if you have a suspicious digital rectal exam, that's more likely to make you do a biopsy. So We've got a question on bioparametric MRI, and the question is whether it's good enough compared to multiparametric MRI. And um, it's a really interesting question, and some of the advantages of a bioparametric MRI that I discuss in the webinar um, will mean that it's important that we explore that. And I think the uh, advantages of a contrast sequence should not be underestimated. So particularly when you have an MRI with, say, artifacts because the diffusion-weighted images may not be good, that's when the contrast sequences are really, really of value. Now, there are some lesions which are identified only by contrast, particularly small lesions, lesions in the anterior fibromuscular stroma. In addition, the size of the lesion is often best estimated with the contrast. So, there are arguments to say that the contrast may add something to the bioparametric MRI alone. We know previous data from some larger studies, particularly from Scandinavia, um, show that bioparametric MRI does have a good performance. But I think we're at a stage now where it's important to investigate this in a prospective study with appropriate power. And the prime study, which I mentioned, will hopefully be starting to recruit later this year and may be able to shed some light on that. So we've got another question on the MRI scoring system um, about what is the role of the LICAT scoring system in 2020? So the LICAT scoring system and the PIRAD scoring system are important things to discuss the differences about. 
So both scoring systems come to a conclusion on the likelihood of prostate cancer on a one to five scale. The difference is how you get there. So the PIRAD scoring system uses quite a rigid uh, set of criteria to get to each score. The LICAT scoring system uses the radiologist's own experience to be able to get to that score. Now, in centers who are learning to read MRI, it's useful to use the PIRAD scoring system as a basis of what they do. As centers get more experienced, they may wish to use their own experience to adapt the scoring of the PIRAD scoring system. And in the precision study, that's what we saw. We tended to have experienced radiologists and when we did our central quality control, we found that differences were often because um, radiologists were using their own experience to alter what the PIRAD score showed, which means effectively you're using a Likert score. And there have been studies comparing the two. Um, a study recently by the Imperial Group in London, I believe, actually showed that a Likert score performed better than the PIRAD score with expert radiologists. However, I think when learning and having a standardized scoring system, um, you won't go wrong in using the PIRAD scoring system. Um, and I think future iterations of the PIRAD um, scoring system may incorporate some of the information we're learning from things like studies investigating biparametric versus multiparametric MRI. Okay, so we've got a question on PIRAD3 lesions and what's my view on PIRAD3 lesions? So this is an interesting group of patients who are uncertain about whether that lesion represents significant cancer or not. And the overall detection rate of significant cancer, i.e. Gleason 3 plus 4 or greater in PIRAD3 lesions is actually quite low. So in the precision study, if I remember correctly, is less than 15%. So the thing that we need to think about is, do we biopsy all of the PIRAD3 lesions or not? And there's an argument to apply other biomarkers such as PSA density in this group of patients. And PSA densities of 0.12 or 0.15 have been raised as possibilities. So if you have a low PSA density and a PIRAS3 lesion, you could consider avoiding a biopsy. And if you have a high PSA density with a PIRAS3 lesion, you could consider doing a biopsy. I think, again, this comes down to discussing the MRI and the patient's case with them. And telling them what your likelihood of detecting significant cancer is and offering them the choice of having a biopsy or not. And I think certainly now it's perfectly acceptable to biopsy PIRAD3 lesions, but equally if you wanted to minimize harm to patients and optimize detection of significant cancer and minimize detection of insignificant cancer, we should be looking towards trying to biopsy men with PIRAD3 lesions who really do need a biopsy. And some of those adjuncts which I mentioned may be useful and I hope will be the subject of future research to help us focus on that group of patients. Okay, so I've got a question about um, using MRI as a screening tool. And do I prefer multiparametric MRI or biparametric MRI as a screening tool? Now, one of the things about a screening test, so we're talking about population screening here, is that the test has to be relatively easy and quick to administer. So if MRI were to be used as a screening test, then a biparametric MRI would be more likely to be of use. Um, screening in general, as mentioned, is controversial. So whether or not we could do as many biparametric MRIs as we need to if we were to do population screening is an important and valid question to ask whether or not it would lead to identification of a condition that would lead to improved patient survival is the key question. And uh, for the role of MRI as a screening test for population screening, we're very early on in that story. So I think the next few years will shed a bit more light into it. So I've got a question about targeting and targeted biopsies in the era of transperineal approach, whether or not transperineal will replace the truss biopsy approach. So this is an interesting question. So in the precision study and in the MRI first study, a transrectal targeted biopsy was allowed. In precision, some centers did it with transperineal targeted biopsy. Now, studies like the Hafner study from um, the Bies group in 2011 show that if you have a center with expertise in transrectal targeting, 
you can target lesions, even anterior ones, quite well. My personal feeling is a transperineal approach is a more systematic way of approaching targeting. And particularly with the advent of local anesthetic transperineal biopsy, with devices recently introduced to help that process, I think being able to do a local anesthetic transperineal biopsy with targeted biopsies would be a very good approach to replace the truss biopsy approach. Of course, the infection risk would be lower, and um, your cancer detection rates, as seen from many studies, would be higher. So I think if you have expertise in transrectal targeting, there's no harm in doing that. If you have the option to do local anesthetic transperineal biopsy, I think that's also a very good option, and that's my preferred approach. Okay, so I've got a question of how can we apply the results of the current trials in low and middle volume centers? So I think that's an important point, and we know that the majority of centers taking part in the studies which we've spoken about are those which are more experienced. There's a few points to mention. Um, the 1.5 Tesla MRI scanner is the most commonly available MRI scanner around, and that was the scanner that was used exclusively in the PROMISE study. In addition, it was allowed in both the MRI first and precision studies. So we have demonstrated good results using the typical kind of MRI scanners available at most centers, and it doesn't necessarily have to be in a very uh, detailed three tester scanner. I think with regards to the quality of the MRI, um, that's the conduct of the MRI, um, and the performance of the people um, doing the biopsies or reporting the scans, there needs to be an element of teaching. And this means um, centers which have a low volume of performing these things should pair up with centers who have more experience, and they should learn from the center. Um, teaching in terms of skills of how, how to look at the MRI and use that information should also be a priority, and there are teaching courses at the radiology and urology conferences now readily available for both radiologists and urologists. And we should also look to proctor each other on the targeting techniques, and part of that means evaluating your own results and knowing what your detection rates of cancer are according to Likert or Pyrad score, and being able to compare that to what's been published in the literature. Um, the key is, in the center starting out, to review all of your results in a centralized meeting. That way, the radiologists know when they're missing cancer. The urologists or radiologists taking the biopsies know when they're having a targeting error. And you can make decisions on whether or not to re-biopsy patients based on that. And a centralized meeting is probably one of the most important things you can do. So we've got a question on, has there been a um, cost-effectiveness analysis um, considering doing an MRI first, um, and I, is introducing this technology going to be cost effective? Now, there have been. So there have been cost effectiveness studies done in the UK healthcare setting, the Canadian healthcare setting, the US healthcare setting, and the Dutch healthcare setting, which show that indeed it can be cost effective to use MRI upfront. Um, rather than doing systematic biopsy in everyone. And the cost savings are initially in men uh, with a negative MRI avoiding a biopsy, but in the long term, far greater cost savings are in identifying a greater proportion of men with significant cancer who have an appropriate treat treatment decision made, and therefore um, it will be uh, easier to manage them in the long term. Whereas if you have incorrect treatment decisions made based on missing cancer, for example, then these men are more likely to have metastatic disease later on in life and cost more to manage. So yes, there have been cost-effectiveness analyses showing that MRI upfront can be cost-effective. So there's a question about the PRIME study and whether or not there'll be standardization on the type of biparametric or multiparametric MRI used and how we will account for differences in radiological reporting standards. So uh, part of the limitation of some of the studies uh, that people talk about are that they're only done at expert centers and they're done using particular protocols. So we're gonna take a slightly different approach and we want the results to be generalizable to many centers. So 
there will be a quality control element of studies of centers entering the study and the MRIs will be reviewed in advance or they can just show data from work they've done on how good their detection rates are. In terms of uh, accounting for differences in radiological reporting standards, um, if a center has shown a good enough quality MRI to start off with and reasonable data for how good um, their MRI and targeted biopsies are, they'll be allowed to take part and we will assess afterwards with central quality control whether or not the central experienced radiologists agreed with all of the other radiologists on their MRI scoring and that will be presented to show um, the agreement between the different radiologists. So this is really good. We've got uh, literally hundreds of questions coming in. So thank you all for um, listening and participating. So um, there's a question here about, do you have any specific recommendations on the conduct of 1.5T or 3T endorectal coil or not? So the first thing I'd comment is, um, when performing the MRI, um, you should perform it to certain minimum standards which are specified in the PIRADS 2 guidelines. And I would uh, advise you guys to show your radiologist um, this guideline to follow. And the second thing to say is we've done a lot of work in the UK on quality control and uh, we've got a network of scans which are being reviewed centrally. And what we've found is, is if you have a 1.5 Tesla scanner, which is appropriately optimized, um, and if it's been carried out with, on a scanner that's relatively new, say within the last six years, this is perfectly acceptable. And it doesn't have to be a new 3T scanner to get good results. Um, in terms of endorectal coil or not, I think there's no strong evidence that you have to have an endorectal coil in order to achieve good quality images. However, those centers that do use an endorectal coil can produce nice images. So again, um, I would say it's down to your local expertise. If you don't have an endorectal coil, you don't have to get one. So I've got a question here about, in my practice, do I actually use multi-parametric MRI as a screening tool in advance? So this uh, presumably means before I have the man's PSA. So currently in clinical practice, this is not done. Um, it's only as part of the study. So in practice, um, I receive referrals from uh, general practitioners who have men with raised PSAs or abnormal digital rectal examinations primarily as the way of being referred. So I've got a question here about a negative MRI targeted biopsy. If you have a negative MRI targeted biopsy but an increasing PSA on follow-up, would you go for a re-biopsy? Will you do an MRI before the rebiopsy? And will it be only for targeted and or systematic? And how much time from the first biopsy will you wait? So I think one of the things to think about is uh, the negative predictive value of an MRI and the targeted biopsy compared to say what we've been used to doing for the previous 25 years, which is a trust biopsy. And we've been quite happy to discharge men with a negative trust biopsy to their general practitioners or PSA follow-up. And actually, with a negative MRI targeted biopsy, providing it's been done appropriately and reviewed appropriately, the negative predictive value is much higher. So in actual fact, this should be more reassuring to all the urologists who used to do trust biopsies and had negative trust biopsies and discharge patients than a negative trust biopsy. So um, what would I do? I think the thing to say is to give them some pragmatic advice on PSA follow-up. So um, depending on their baseline risk, say for example, a six month or 12 month PSA after a negative MRI target biopsy. And if the PSA on the six month and 12 months is increased beyond what I would expect from a natural increase in that time, then yes, I would see them again. Um, if it's an early PSA rise, you may consider doing a systematic biopsy. If it's later, say at one year or later, you can consider redoing an MRI if you can see that there is an increase in conspicuity of the initial lesion that you targeted, it might be that you've missed the target and you want to re-biopsy it. Or you might see a new lesion that needs targeting, but certainly if the MRI targeted biopsy missed the lesion and the new MRI didn't show anything new, you would consider doing that systematic biopsy. So we've got a question on antibiotics. Um, prior to the biopsy and whether or not we should routinely give antibiotics prior to biopsy. Um, so antibiotic use 
is a very topical subject at the moment. Um, you would have seen some of the EAU endorsed guidelines on not giving uh, fluoroquinolones before a trust biopsy uh, because of potential side effects. And I think one of the things to do to uh, minimize risk of infection is to move from a transrectal to a transperineal approach. We know that in general, the infection rates are lower with a transperineal approach. Um, the second thing to think about is whether or not you need to give antibiotics. So I think if you're going to do a trust biopsy, you should give antibiotics. If you're going to do a transperineal biopsy, at the moment, there's no uh, randomized trial to show us that we can avoid giving them. But the infection rates are so low, it might seem sensible that it would be possible to avoid doing that. And men may not necessarily um, receive harm from doing that. But the evidence is limited to support that practice. So in reality, most men with transperineal biopsy still get antibiotics, and that's what I do in my practice as well. Um, perhaps in the future, there could be a registry with patients, and we could look at the um, infection rates in patients who don't have um, antibiotics. But um, there would be a bit more evidence needed before I could say confidently to avoid biopsies prior to transperineal biopsy. But the low prevalence rate of infections after that would suggest that it's potentially possible. So um, we've got a question about the use of MRI in active surveillance and whether it can replace biopsy. So I think um, active surveillance is um, an interesting subject. There have been uh, studies like the ASSIST randomized trial, uh, some updated data of which has been recently published in European Urology. And what it shows is, is that using an MRI in the pathway can actually improve your adherence to an active surveillance program and decrease the number of patients failing active surveillance. In terms of whether or not we can avoid doing biopsy altogether, I think it's probably difficult to avoid doing biopsy altogether. However, there is research looking into using MRI and PSA kinetics to decide whether or not a patient needs a biopsy. And if the PSA kinetics and MRI are favorable, to consider avoiding a biopsy. Now, there's no um, strong evidence saying that that's how practice should be, but that's what we're looking at considering. Equally, there has been other evidence which has shown that if you adopt that approach, in some centers, you may miss significant cancer by avoiding the biopsy. So I think it's something that should be used in the process of active surveillance. <clears throat> and there are guidelines, called the precise guidelines, which are used to allow you to use MRI in active surveillance. But you should use that with the information of the PSA kinetics, um, the patient in front of you, the MRI scan, and what the patient wants as well um, to decide what to do. And if you're following these patients up carefully, you're more likely to be able to avoid a biopsy. But I think we should await a bit more evidence before making a clear guideline recommendation on that. So I've got a question. Um, this will probably be the last question that we've got time for. So it's about the management of octogenarians with good health and a suspicious digital rectal examination. So I think I would manage these patients um, as I would any other. If they have a good life expectancy, and I think it's going to be more than 10 years, um, then I would discuss further investigation with them. And that would include things like a PSA. Um, and if the PSA or digital rectal examination is abnormal, I would consider an MRI scan. Um, if your premise for investigating them in the first place is that they have a good life expectancy and would potentially uh, stand to gain from having treatment, then I see no reason why they should not be able to have a, an MRI as well. Okay, so uh, I'm very grateful for all of you joining me today at this webinar. I hope it's been useful for you. And I'm very happy to take questions uh, my uh, Twitter handle is on the screen. Um, in addition, um, I'm excited to look forward to the next European School of Urology webinar, which will be next month, and it will be continuing on this theme, looking at the role of MRI specifically in active surveillance by Dr. Francesco Giganti. So with that, um, good evening to you all from London, and I'll speak to you soon.